If I ask you that how rich Anil Ambani is, you will probably go on Google and start typing how rich is Anil Ambani and then you will figure out that okay, he's actually bankrupt. He filed for bankruptcy. But interestingly, if you actually look at the type of lifestyle he's currently enjoying, by no measure he would be considered as a bankrupt person. Similarly, if you study about Donald Trump's wealth, you will quickly figure out that Mr. Donald Trump has filed for bankruptcy four times in his life. Then again, you will say that, you know, he travels in like private jets, he has his own golf course, he has like so much real estate. Then by what definition is he bankrupt? The point that I'm trying to outline through these simple stories is that rich people, despite bankruptcy, they are able to retain their wealth or many of them are able to do that. The prime reason for that is that they actually understand the law. They also know how to bend the rules without breaking them. And in the process, they stay active. They are able to preserve that wealth. This is very different from the middle class mindset that you and I usually have. For us, we will always follow the rules. We will just go with the herd mentality. Whatever new app is coming out, we will go and experiment with them. So as a result, we get trapped into modern financial traps that are built for us like new apps, vagera, vagera, which the rich people benefit by trapping us. So on this video, I'm going to speak about these eight very modern traps that are set for you. These could be things like, you know what, getting 12% guaranteed returns, investing 5,000 rupees in a startup so that we can also call ourselves as mini sharks, whatnot. So all these are modern day traps. If you avoid them, you will definitely become rich. So point number one is that rich people understand the risk reward curve, but the middle class people or new age investors really struggle to understand this equation. So let me help you understand this point by using a couple of examples. But first and foremost, to understand what risk reward curve means, take a look at this particular graph. So for example here if you are investing in fixed deposits that is what that is a low risk investment and the return is also low. So it's a low risk low reward equation. On the flip side if you go and invest in cryptos that's completely other end of the spectrum. So here the risk is also very high and the reward is also very high. So when rich people invest they understand that they are putting their money somewhere along this curve. They can take high risk, they can take low risk, they usually balance out their portfolio. So that is the perspective with which they invest. On the flip side, the normal retail investors or normal common investors or new investors who are getting into the market, who want to grow their wealth, they keep on believing in like pointless arguments. Like, you know what, if I give my money to some app, it will grow it at 12%, 13%, 14% club, this, that. So I'm not naming the app directly, but you know which apps I'm speaking about. So they commit to the fact that, you know what, if you give us money, we will be giving you 12% return guaranteed. Okay, it sounds great in theory. But the problem is that just understand, again, that equation, from risk reward perspective. Usually these type of apps weave these rosy dreams that you know what, if you give us your money, we will grow it at 12%. Okay, great. You have talked about the first half of the equation, but you have forgotten to mention the risk part of the curve. So this is something that normal retail investors or normal new age investors fail to understand and they are not able to grow their wealth. On the flip side, rich investors like Robert Kiyosaki, Warren Buffett, they understand this point and they balance their portfolio accordingly. I have received so many questions, queries that, you know what, Akshat, can you please talk about this particular app? It is promising to give 12% return. Should I invest all my money in it? You should definitely not invest all your money in it. Why? For the simple point that the risk associated with such investment is also going to be fairly high. So I hope you get this point. Let's move on to the second point. Now, when it comes to rich people, they mostly live on rent in early part of their life rather than owning stuff. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me give you a practical example. So I live in South Goa and it is one of the poshest society that I'm living in. It has a bunch of villas and I get to speak with my neighbors quite frequently. And I've learned that majority of the people living in this neighborhood, they A, own their businesses, at least most of them, and they are living on rent. This is something that you might have also noticed with people in the business community that typically the business community people, what they simply do is that rather than buying a house in the early part of their life, they will put that money where? Into their business. For example, creating a factory, buying a land or using that money to generate some kind of cash flow. They will not stick that money in terms of buying a house. Now, what do middle class people do? Now, I'm not trying to criticize the middle class. I'm just telling you the practical reality so that you can pick up these type of points. So typically middle class people, what they would do is that Jesse Nokri Lagi, as soon as I get a job, I will start an EMI on my home loan. So that is called as buying things too early in life. Now, I'm not against buying a house. If you're getting a good deal, definitely buy a house. You should have a house at some stage in your life, vagera, vagera. I'm not against it at all. But the timing of that buying decision needs to be really thought through. So again, I'll give you a second example of Mr. Mark Cuban, who is one of my favorite entrepreneurs. And here is an article about him. And he advises people when they are in their early 20s to live a very frugal life. 
Now, one of the core tenets or principles of living a frugal life is that you must rent more before you buy. The third thing that rich people do really, really well is that they know how to protect their downside. Now, what is the meaning of protecting the downside? So, let me explain this by some of the FAQs or frequently asked questions that I typically get. So, I get a lot of questions from college going students that, sir, my family income is not very high and I'm struggling in my life currently, but I want to study abroad and I've gotten an admission from this top university, but my fees is like one and a half crores and on the flip side i'm getting like this very good scholarship and it is giving me a free ride but it is 10th rank so which college should i pick okay so i will simply push you to investigate the worst case scenario here that if you are getting full scholarship from a decent college getting no scholarship from a college which you can't afford what is the logical decision here i'll not even spell it out for you you guys are smart enough so protecting the downside simply means that you don't end up making decisions that can literally wipe off your wealth now many a times college students reach out to me they say that you know what I am not enjoying my college degree. I want to become a full-time trader and I will trade. Now, do you know that almost 99% of traders do not even beat fixed deposit returns? Now, this is the data that comes from Zerudha. And again, we should not be making the type of decisions that can wipe off your wealth or just put you in a situation where you are completely paralyzed and you do not know that once you fail in that situation, what are you going to do next? So that aspect is called as protecting the downside. Now, rich people are fairly good at this. Now, one of the prime reasons why they are good at this is that A, they create multiple types of incomes. For example, they have active income, they have passive income, they have portfolio income, they have a network which they can leverage, they start building brands. So, they do a bunch of different things. I will not belabor this point because there is a separate video that I have done on this topic. I will link it down below in case you want to learn more about it. But to cut the long story short, rich people, what they do is that they create a portfolio of different incomes, a portfolio of different assets that kind of protects their downside risk. Now comes the natural question that how can I protect my downside risk? Now one of the foremost things that you can do there is that please have insurance. Do not experiment with the fact you know what baad mein lenge, because this puts you and your family at greater risk and it is very very important to hedge your downside risk. Now many of you would say that okay in the latest budget it was announced that in the new tax regime the incentives to buy insurance would be withdrawn. Now again, please ask a natural question that why is it that you need insurance? Is it to grow your money? The answer is no. Many insurance companies sell insurance that way, but that is not the objective of insurance. Is it to get like tax benefits? Only then you will buy insurance. Again, that is not the right answer. The only reason why you need to have insurance is fairly simple to protect the downside. And to buy insurance, do check out Ditto. They are a wonderful platform. You can speak with an insurance expert for free, absolutely free. You can use the link in the comment and description box to schedule your free phone call. I have personally purchased my insurance by using Ditto Insurance. The fourth thing that rich people do is that they actually own real assets. Now you say all assets are real. What is the difference between real asset and fake asset? So let me give you two examples there. The first example is of REITs versus real estate. Now think about it this way that have you ever read in the newspaper that, that Donald Trump purchased $5 million worth of REITs? No, you would have read that he actually purchased physical real estate. In India, if you go, again, have you ever read that this rich builder, for example, Hira Nandani's, they invested in REITs. Now again, you will read that, okay, Hira Nandani's purchased this crore of real estate. Now, what is the point that I'm trying to drive home? The point is that these days in finance, a lot of things are packaged in a certain way. For example, you will be given the assurance that, okay, if you're investing in REITs, you can do it with only 5,000 rupees. What's the big harm? Just go and invest 5,000 rupees. You'll become Malik of some house. No, that is not correct. In REITs, what ends up happening is that you end up owning the shares in a particular company. Now, theoretically, now again, this is a highly debatable point. I have made a separate video on REITs. Please go and watch it. But just to contextualize things, if you are owning, let's say, five shares in a particular REITs company, what are you actually owning? You are owning some kind of a paper asset. On the flip side, if you are owning five shares of Hindustan Unilever, again, what are you owning? You are owning a fractional ownership in a particular company. Now, think about it this way that REITs, what is the underlying here? The underlying is the real estate. Why do you buy real estate? That is very simple to gain control over a particular property, so to say, so that you can rent it out. That decision is yours. You can do a bunch of stuff on it. But when you're buying in REITs, you get absolutely zero control. So this is the biggest problem in terms of buying REIT. Personally, I will prefer investing investing my money in good companies like Hindustan Unilever, HDFC Bank, etc. Because the underlying growth of these business is much higher compared to the real estate growth to begin with. And also when you are buying REITs, you are again getting paper assets and absolutely zero control. Now you'll say that, okay, fine, REITs wala point samaj mein aata hai. But what about gold? 
uh, because I find it very difficult to buy physical gold, store physical gold, all this jig jig is there. So does it make sense for me to go and buy something like sovereign gold bond? So again, have you ever read that Robert Kiyosaki invested in sovereign gold bond or some variant of it? The answer is no, he actually buys physical gold. Any rich person who believes in the gold story, they end up procuring physical gold. Is there Jamila associated with it? Absolutely yes. There are Jamilas associated in terms of procuring gold, storing it, etc, etc. But to cut the long story short, it serves a specific purpose. People buy gold as a hedge for risk. Now, what is the meaning of hedge for risk? For example, if there is some kind of government default or if there is increased risk or if there are wars breaking out between countries, then in such a situation, gold becomes a good asset. But what type of gold? Sovereign gold bond? The answer is no. It is the physical gold that gains value. In the event a particular government defaults, I'm not talking about the Indian government here, but generally if a particular government defaults, then any type of bond, including the gold bond, its value will go to absolute zero. So rich people, what they actually own is real assets, not fake assets. Rich people know where their money is actually going, but majority of the new investors or middle class are unaware of this fact. So let me give you some examples and back it up with some logic and facts here. For example, many of the rich people, they invest via hedge funds. Now, hedge funds are what? So hedge funds are managed by these big, big people like, you know, Bill Ackman and Mr. Ray Dalio. So they run their own hedge funds and these people manage other rich people's money. Now, the rich people actually somewhat closely monitor the performance of hedge funds. The hedge funds tells them they have frequent calls with these rich people. They explain them why they are investing in certain assets versus not, etc, etc. So, for example, let's say that if Mr. Mukesh Ammani is giving his money to Bill Ackman to manage, then he will keep a very close eye on him. And Mr. Bill Ackman is going to explain categorically where Mr. Mukesh Ammani money is being invested. But on the flip side, when it comes to average investors and new age investors, what ends up happening? Majority of us, even if we are investing our money in equities or other form of asset classes, what do we do? We typically give it to mutual fund managers. Now, do we have a sense where our money is going in mutual funds? For most of us, the answer is no. On top of that, these days you might have seen apps. What are they doing? They are saying that, you know what, we will automate the investments for you. All you have to do is that, you know what, Avna Ram se shopping pe jao. We will round it off to 100 rupees and 5 rupees will go to some asset. You will say that, okay, ye to bahut badiya cheez hai, right? Automatic investment ho hai. But the problem there is that there are two layers of commissions now. How two layers? One is that, see, these apps or new age apps are not doing some kind of dan dharm, right? They are going to take some commissions from you. Second, if they are rounding off and giving money to some mutual fund manager to invest on your behalf, then there is a second layer of commission. Now you'll say that, okay, thoda bahut commission lag bhi gaya, little bit commission here and there. So what's the big deal? It's not as if that that is the end of the world. If I'm paying 1% commission extra, what's that big deal? Now the problem with 1% commission can be understood through this simple example. So let's say that you are putting 1 lakh rupee in the stock market and you are able to generate 10% return. So what does that become? It becomes 1.1 lakhs. Now, if you are paying 1% additional, then how much profit percentage you are paying? So the answer comes out to be roughly 10%. How? You do the math and tell me in the comment box. But that is the analysis that I'll leave you with. So when you say 1% of my AUM is being paid in commissions, you need to acknowledge the fact that that 1% AUM or asset under management is equivalent to almost 10% of your profit sometime. So be very, very cognizant about where your money is going, how much commissions you are paying. So all these rich people know this game and us new normal investors keep on believing in this automation stuff. Now, rich people do not take consumer loans, they take business loans. And on their business, they take further consumer loans. Now, how does this mechanism play out? Let me use some examples to illustrate the power of this point. So again, coming back to the example where we started the story of Mr. Anil Ammani. So Anil Ammani went bankrupt, but his personal wealth or a large part of his personal wealth is intact. How is that possible? Okay, so in India, we have a concept called as LLC or limited liability company or limited liability company or limited liability partnership. Now, what does limited liability means? It simply means that there is a bifurcation between individuals wealth and their company's wealth. For example, if I'm creating a company called as Wisdom Hatch and you can go and check out our company also, we run wonderful courses to help you understand investment better. We have a wonderful community that is built around it and people discuss with each other to improve their investment acumen. So imagine that I'm running this company and I take out a business loan on it. For example, let's say five crore rupees. Now, if for some reason the company goes bankrupt, it will not hurt me personally. So let's imagine that my personal worth is 10 crore rupee. I've kept that into my bank account, but I have taken a five crore rupee loan on my business, which is Wisdom Hatch. If the company goes under, 
what happened in Mr. Anil Ambani's case, that company is gone. There is no money that is coming out of it. But my personal wealth stays intact. Of course, it is more complicated than this. But I hope you understood the difference between taking business loan and personal loans. So majority of the rich people, what they do is that they create their own companies, take loans on it. And on these companies, they take further loans to buy more assets. Now this will go into a conspiracy realm. So I'll come back to the topic. So the lesson that we need to draw out via the story is fairly simple, that you and I should at least avoid taking a lot of personal loans. Because one day it might happen that we might want to start our own business. We might want to take loans for productive purposes. So then our credit score and credit uptake might get hit. So please be very, very cognizant about the things for which you are taking loan on. So rich people understand in what things they are investing their money in. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. So these days there is a prashalan that is going on that, you know what? Shark Tank culture is there and normal retail investors can also invest in startups. While it has startup investing might require a lot of money, but you can become an angel investor. Just invest like 3000 rupees, 5000 rupees and you can call yourself as angel investors. Now, do you understand where your money is going? How will you be able to liquidate that? The short answer is no. Why am I saying no? Because any startup that you're investing in, do you get to ask yourself questions the way people do on Shark Tank? The short answer is no, you don't. There will be some pitch deck that will be attached on that particular website through which you are investing. And beyond that, you will not have any understanding. Are the financial statements audited of those startups where you are investing your money? Again, the answer is no. Do you have any third party commentary on those startups? In majority of the cases, no. Even finding basic information on that startup will become difficult. But people are getting swayed into this entire ecosystem that you know what, just go and become angel investors. As a retail investor, you will make crazy amount of money. Now, other set of problems come in. For example, once you have stuck your money or given your money in a particular startup, liquidity it becomes very very difficult what is the meaning of liquidation it simply means that for example tomorrow you go and buy HDFC bank stock now then day after tomorrow if you don't like it you can sell it off why because there is liquidity liquidity means that there are buyers of your share of HDFC bank but can you do the same when you are doing startup investing the short answer is no your money is likely to get stuck it will be very difficult for you to liquidate those positions now rich people invest in startups rich people invest in real estate rich people invest in businesses they do stock investing they do hedge fund investing vagera vagera with the intent that they are understanding the exact deal that they are getting so they spread their little little money across different set of asset classes and build positions accordingly this is something that we should all understand that be very very cognizant wherever your money is going and understand the pros and cons of the asset class that you're choosing to invest your money in. Rich people have portfolio of incomes, not portfolio of money saving strategies. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me contextualize by giving a few examples. So for example, point number one here is that it is easier to make money than to save money. Why am I saying it? Because the rate at which the mehengai is going up, just check the rate at which you eat restaurant food. Three years ago, if you were getting a bill of 400, 500 rupees, now at the same restaurant, the per head bill might come out to be 800, 900 rupees. So the inflation or the price rise in the economy is just going up at a wacky pace. So according to me, there is hardly any major benefit in terms of figuring out five strategies on how to get like more cash back or which credit card should I use today in order to save like 25 rupees more. Now, I'm not saying that these things are completely useless. They might be okay every once in a while if you're doing it, it's fine. If there is some system that you have built, it is completely cool. But your energy should be focused in terms of developing or cultivating your wide majority of entire portfolio income. Now, on an average, every millionaire has eight sources of income. So your mental energy and thought process should go where? It should go towards generating more income streams. Figuring out how, if you're having a day job, how you can work over the weekends to build second source of income. If there is a way you can launch digital products or if you can cultivate some kind of community, can you monetize that? Learn business analysis skills. Now, when I'm giving these type of tips, people take it in a very wrong spirit sometimes. They'll say, yeah, you're a money-minded person. You always talk about money. No, that is not the viewpoint. In the modern world, money indicates somewhat freedom. It gives you luxury to travel places, to save your time, to spend more time with your family. So understanding and cultivating this positive thought process is going to put you on that track of financial and time independence. So that is the spirit with which I've made this video. I hope that you are able to grasp all the eight points and I'm really really hopeful that you will not fall into these modern day financial traps let me know in the comment box which of these traps you are currently witnessing and do you agree with my thought process and if you have more points to add thank you so much and I'll see you soon